you coming over? John and I, we thought maybe we'd sing a little song for you to get started. We were praying for that lay Miz spirit to descend on us. That was wonderful. Yeah, it was great. That was wonderful. Well, my name is John Teeter. I'm from Long Beach. I'm a church planter and the director of evangelism for the Covenant Church. And I'll be sharing after Chrissy. So great. Chrissy, take it away. Thanks, John. Well, it is a real honor and a privilege for me to be here with you this evening. Um, Dr. Perkins, Coach, and Anne, Mary Ann, and Wayne, I just wanted, Noel, thank you for um, this privilege and for giving us the opportunity to serve along with you. I feel like, Dr. Perkins, you've been talking a lot in the last few years about um, writing a new song, and we are the song of your lives. And we are the letter that you've written to the church, and it's a great privilege for me to be a part of that. Um, I'm from Costa Mesa, California, in Southern California, and uh, nice, it's good to have the SoCal people with us this week. What I brought for you um, is a jar of dirty, snotty Kleenex. This is my, my jar of tears, and uh, sometime earlier this year, I started saving the Kleenex from the times that I wept over my city, and I don't know why it seemed important, but at this time in our city where there was just pain after tragedy, after bad decision, I, I felt like I needed to do something. And I didn't know what to do with my pain. So I just shoved the Kleenex in the jar and I saved it. I know it's really gross. Um, <laughs> Mary Ann says it's innovative. I told a friend that I was going to take my jar of pain and um, my, present it to our city council, as if somehow when I gave them snot, they would suddenly be able to make good decisions. <laughs> the thing is, like, I, I didn't know where to present my pain. And some of you, most of you in here, know what I'm talking about. You know that, that kind of pain that wells up in you until it comes out like sobs. And many of you, you could fill a pantry with jars of Kleenex that you've cried over your cities. Some of you wept with me this last December when the DREAM Act, it didn't pass again. And it was Christmas and everyone was celebrating around us and we wept bitterly because we knew for our undocumented students it meant delayed hope and there's a nagging urgency for us. We tweeted and we blogged because we didn't know where to present our pain. We've been talking a lot about innovating this week. When I think of innovate, I, I literally think of Jeremy Del Rio. <laughs> I literally think of the people that have shared with us this week. Your books are the ones that I read. Your models are the ones that I copy. The people here in CCDA, you're the innovators for me. And as I was preparing for this and I was reading, I found that innovate doesn't necessarily have to be something brand new. It can mean to make changes. And in this year, I've had to make some changes in where I present my pain. And this year, I've learned um, to weep with the Lord. In John 11, it says that um, Jesus wept. But right before that, there's this really beautiful interaction between Martha and Jesus, and I'd like to spend our time there this evening. It's in John 11:17. You know the story. Most of us, John, um, Lazarus has passed away. They've buried him. Mary and Martha are grieving, and Jesus still hasn't shown up. Starting in verse 17 of John 11. When Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem, and many of the people had come to console Martha and Mary in their loss. When Martha got word that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise when everyone else rises at the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never, ever die. Do you believe this, Martha? 
Yes, Lord, she told him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. The first thing that I see in this story is that Martha went out to Jesus. It says that he was coming into town and she heard he was coming and so she went toward him. In her grief and in her pain, even while she was mourning, she went toward him. So when I read this story at this season in my life, I think, I gotta change my direction. I gotta go to Jesus with my pain. Even though she was confused why he hadn't shown up, she went out toward him. We're all going home tonight or tomorrow. Who are you headed to with your pain? With the burdens that, that you carry? What direction are you going with that? Because while we're here, we're looking for the new partner and we're looking for the new model. And when we get home, we're going to go in that strategic direction and then we're going to go after that grant. But who do you go toward with the burdens that you're carrying? Martha's taught me to change my direction. And I see in this story, too, an opportunity to uh, change perspective. Jesus, when he shows up, he changes Martha's perspective. It says, uh, if you had only been here, this wouldn't have happened. And Jesus tells her, your brother will rise again. And she says, yeah, I know, I know. He'll rise again when everyone else rises. And it's almost like you can hear that re um, resignation in her voice. I know, I know, he'll rise again. And sometimes even when Jesus is standing right in front of us, we don't see it. And he says, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Right now, right here, in the situation that you're in, I am. I was thinking of this um, at a recent board meeting. I know, one of the most profound statements of Jesus, and I bring up a board meeting, right? But we were um, bringing on a new board member, one of our neighborhood leaders, and she was nervous about interacting with our board and getting in with the group, and, and I was nervous for her. I wasn't sure how they were all gonna gel together. She had met the chairman of our board, Bob, and he's a successful business guy, and Anna and he had seemed to get along fine, but I was just thinking, how do I, how do I facilitate these relationships. And so I started plotting and scheming a, a board retreat to help them really make connections well. And I was thinking through and, and just really praying about how do we open up space for dialogue about reconciliation. And the next board meeting came along and uh, Bob said to Anna and during the meeting, hey, why don't you tell the rest of the board what happened? And I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about. And Anna begins to share how she had lupus and she had shared this with Bob when they first met. And Bob said, I'll, I'll pray for you. And that night when Bob got there, they greeted each other, and Bob said, I've been praying for you. How's your health? And she said, I don't have lupus anymore. I've been healed. I went to the doctor, and they don't know what happened, but I'm healed. And, and she shared the story with my board. Yeah. And I watched them, like, rejoice together and, and praise God. And after I, I went to her and I said, Anna, how come you didn't tell me that that God had healed you. And she said, well, Bob asked about my health and you didn't. <laughs> and I heard the Lord say, I am the resurrection and the life. Chrissy, while you are plotting and scheming about how to get people to reconcile, I'm connecting their hearts. And while you're planning health clinics and seminars, I'm healing right here, right now. Change your perspective, see what I'm doing here. What are the situations that you're going back to in your community where you're resigned that they're just not going to change? That you're resigned to, we will, we'll, we'll wait till Jesus comes again. Could it be that Jesus is standing in front of you right now saying, I am. I am what you need in this situation right now. I am the resurrection and the life. We get a change in our perspective when we take our pain to Jesus. And I see too in this story that he's beginning to uh, change my notion of friendship. We know how he goes on and, and heal, raises Lazarus from the dead, and in the beginning of chapter 12, Martha's throwing a big party, and they're celebrating to honor Jesus, that he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus is there, and Lazarus is there, and the Pharisees hear about it, and they come. They come because they want to kill Lazarus. 
They want to kill Lazarus simply because he's been raised from the dead. And that threatened their system. And him being raised from the dead meant that people were leaving their system and following Jesus. And this has got me thinking about what kind of innovations and changes I need to make in my friendship with Jesus. Because I don't know that my friendship with Jesus is so threatening that people want to kill me. And I heard Jim Wallace share on the stage this week, and he talked about how a few years ago he... uh, made a call for all of us to go to Washington, D.C., and he was kind of, you know, making us feel good, like 120 people went. And I remember that. I was sitting in the audience, and I was compelled, so I sent an intern. One of my interns got arrested with Dr. Perkins, and I told people, oh, Micah was represented there. Micah was there. Because it was too risky for me to go. They wanted to kill Lazarus because he was Jesus' friend and he'd been raised from the dead. When I read that, I think, you know, that's my story. I've been crucified with Christ. Now it's not me who lives, but Christ lives in me. We've been resurrected with Christ. And so I have to believe that Lazarus had nothing to lose at that point. He'd already died and been raised again. His life was not his own. He owed it to Jesus. And so that makes me think then, Why don't I go to D.C. and stand up and advocate for the people that I say that I care about? It felt really risky then. We were a new organization, and we had donors that we were trying to convince we were doing a good thing, and, you know, I wasn't sure what they would think if I got arrested. So I sent an intern. But this story and this season in my life has got me thinking what kind of changes I need to make in my friendship with Jesus. Because my life is not my own. Our lives are not our own. We've been resurrected with Christ, and that changes everything. In my neighborhood, um, we work with a lot of undocumented students, and we have a lot of people who will come, and they'll tutor them, and they'll walk with them for years, and they'll even pay for them to go to college. But when we ask them to sign on for legislation that's going to change the system, that's going to set those kids free, it's just a little too much. It's just a little too far to go. And the question the story's got me asking is, how far are we willing to go for our friends? Jesus said that greater love have no one than this, that they lay down their life for their friend. Jesus and Lazarus were friends. Lazarus had nothing to lose. I need to make some changes in my friendships. I need to make some changes in how far I'm willing to go for the people that I call friends in my neighborhood. It's not all about what risks we're willing to take politically. Some of you this week, some things have been stirring in you. You're thinking about asking kids to come in and live with you. You're thinking about maybe you should do something about moving into the neighborhood. You're thinking about maybe you should stay and not move out. And the question that I ask is, how far are we willing to go for the people that we say are our friends? Because our lives are not our own. We've been died, and we've been risen again, raised again with Jesus. We have nothing to lose. Our lives belong to him. I was sharing with a spiritual director of mine um, about some of these nothing-to-lose moments that, that have been coming up for me this year. And in God's grace and his mercy, he gives us second chances, right? Another chance to to either be all in or not. And I was sharing with her about my my fear and my hesitancy. And she said to me, Chrissy, where is Jesus for you right now? Like when when you think about him, where is he? And I knew the answer because it had been inescapable for me for weeks. Because every time I I prayed or I thought of the Lord, I just felt him holding my face, just like this, and he would say, hold my gaze, hold my gaze. And it was like we would bonk foreheads, and he would say, Micha, hold my gaze. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left, hold my gaze. And as I think about the changes that we need to make and the innovations that we're inspired to make after being here this week, I have to believe that we can understand what they are and we'll know what they are when we hold his gaze. When we hold his gaze, we'll know. 
it's a privilege for me to share with you the things that God's been teaching me about changes that we need to make. I simply share with you and bear witness to the things that Jesus has spoken to me that I've heard him say. I simply share with you the things that I saw him do. May it be for the edification of his church and for the praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Chrissy. That was wonderful. Well, greetings from the great city of Los Angeles, CCDA. It's an honor to be here. It was 1959 that my mother, who is a first-generation immigrant from Korea, came with my father and moved into Hacienda Heights, California, because from Korea, she went to Wagner College in New York City, and she was the only Asian during the Korean War, and she enjoyed it. She met a man who had a connection, and she always had a dream for when she was seven years old to be a teacher in America. And she ended up teaching for 54 years in the Bassett Unified School District. She's 82 now, and one of my proudest moments of my life was seeing my mom when she retired. It was really the Asian Mr. Holland's opus. <laughs> and there were th three sets of three generations who came forward and said, this is what Mrs. Teeter did for us, grandma, parent, wow. and child. Wow. It was beautiful. Um, when Noel invited me to speak on education, and then I got to have breakfast this morning with Noel's fifth grade teacher. And I tried to get dirt on him, and she wouldn't give it up. <laughs> um, I was so pleased for the role of education and the gospel. And I've been asked to share some about evangelism as well. I became a Christian at 22 years old, four kind of components of my conversion at 22. Um, I came to college as a recovering meth addict. I uh, found solace in meth my junior and senior year of high school. I graduated with a 1.8 GPA. I worked really hard at community college and I got to UCLA. When I was at UCLA, I had five alcohol violations the first quarter. I denied them all, but I still had to do a lot of community service. I met a Christian, and he was the first Bible I ever read. And how he lived made me thirsty for Jesus, and he answered all of my questions. I had a thousand of them, and he helped me overcome the barrier of Christians. Because my father had died when I was 11 years old in a plane accident left a gaping hole in my soul and our family. And by the time I was a freshman in high school, I tried to fill that with partying. The Christians wrote a five-page letter to me, the Christian Club, five pages, saying exactly what God thought because I was smoking more weed than Snoop Dogg, <laughs> where he's thinking about me, and the reality of hell and how certain it was that I was going there. I should have saved that letter. I might have smoked it. I don't know what I did with it. I should have saved it. They'd be shocked today. But I wish, I wish I could have told the Christian club, drugs aren't my problem. Drugs are my solution. Show me. If you guys are having these secret meetings about me and writing a five-page letter, offer me something. May 8, 1992, I converted to Jesus, and one of the main things, May 92, Los Angeles, one of the main components of my conversion was it was the day after the riots officially ended. And I look back now, 19 years later, and I think that God has called me to lead a multi-ethnic, multi-class church in Long Beach, and I think of CCDA and how we've looked to you for leadership, and I want to thank you and honor you today. God is good. When uh, I went, I was four days old in the Christian faith, and I got invited to a barbecue. So it was a Christian barbecue. I've never, I've never been to church, really. And I converted at a parachurch conference, and I got invited, and they had chicken there. And I met the pastor, and there were about 30 of us, and then they operated in the gifts of the Spirit. So the pastor was sitting there, and he said, let's sing songs. And I really, I thought we were going to do U2 songs. I didn't know that there was, like, Christian music. Right, that's where I was. And then after we sang a couple of songs, the pastor stood up and said, it's time to prophesy. John, stand up. 
And so I didn't know what to do, so I stand up. And he says, thus says the Lord, you will be a teacher of my word. You've made terrible decisions. You've come to faith. That was four days ago. I go, he's a pretty current prophet. He's up on events. Never met the guy in my life. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will lead people to faith. This is how old school it was. They gave me an audio cassette tape. And it says, May 13th, 1992. I have that right on my desk every time I study the Bible because that's my destiny. So I want to challenge us tonight that we will think about Luke 10.9. Now, I love the book of Luke. I love what the missiologist David Bosch says. He says, Matthew, Mark, and John teach you to be Bible-loving, disciple-making, sin-hating, cross-carrying, lost-winning, spirit-filled disciples. The real deal in disciples. Matthew, Mark, and John. But Luke tells you the context. Who's to be the recipients of your discipleship? The poor. As we look at Luke 10, seven quick things I see about Luke 10, one of the great chapters in all of Scripture. We spent 20 minutes. We could spend 20 weeks in Luke 10. First, it's the Trinity in community. It says that Jesus, rejoicing in the Holy Spirit, prays to the Father about evangelism. Two, it's one of the only places where Jesus tells us exactly what to pray for, more workers. Three, and how to pray, earnestly. Four, there are 72 people that are introduced, these anonymous and unknown disciples. I love that it's not Peter. I love that it's not James or John. Who are the 72? What do you actually know about them? Absolutely nothing. And I think Luke wants that. Four or five, there's a ton of joy going on. Six, there's a ton of hope going on. I like to define hope as thinking there's something really good right around the corner. The disciples come back and say, Jesus, you'll never, ever believe what happened when we went in for mission. And I think lastly, Luke has mathematics. His formula for Luke 10, the kingdom math, is 72. He really is into numbers. He talks about how many people come, how many people go. In Luke 9, or in Luke 8, 5,000 people come to Jesus' In-N-Out Burger Fest. Jesus makes 2,000 happy me- or 5,000 happy meals. And he says, that's great, but everyone leaves. But in Luke, in Luke 9, it's 12 go for mission. In Luke 10, it's 72 are sent out for mission. I think Luke is telling us success isn't how many come, because you can fake that. Success is how many go, because now it's on the line. The 72 went out, and Luke 10, 9 is, I think, the verse that God really put on my heart for this sharing time, this message. Luke 10, 9, the disciples went and healed the sick and proclaimed the kingdom. I was blown away during Dr. Perkins' Bible study this morning. The main problem is sin. What are people going to do with their sin that will send them to hell for eternity? That yes, we're called to heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom of God. So, two evangelism insights, a story, and then an exhortation. Are you with me? All right, two evangelism insights. First is, all the people that the 72 are sent to, I think they don't know very much about the Bible. I think if John was here tonight, John 1.10 says, they did not receive him because why? They were hostile, they were angry, no. Because they did not know. There's an education piece that we really need to help people know about the gospel. One of my friends when I was growing up, when I became a Christian, I had to learn to tell my story. Because all these weird, you know, I partied really hard, so all my friends had these crazy ideas about what happened. Someone actually came up to me and said, we heard that your mom locked you in a closet until you became a Christian. (laughs) False. That did not happen. So I had to learn to tell my story. So I started doing Bible studies with all my friends that summer that I converted. We did four Bible studies. And then one of my friends, Dave Juarez, came up to me and said, why don't we do a study that actually means something? Now he'd come to three studies. So I was open for feedback and said, clearly, I'm not reaching you. (laughs) But I said, okay, Dave, tell me what what study would you like to do? And he said, I want to really study John 3.16. What does it mean? 
Now think about your context, your ministry. Of the people that you know that don't go to church, how many people know what John 3.16 means? So I go to Dave. Well, what do you think it means? He goes, I don't want to say. Now Dave is a college graduate, and here's what he says. I think John 3.16 means stop watching football and go to church. So he thinks 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John on the island of Patmos, <laughs> people get weird, they take these weird pills when the Bible's open, right? So I said, why do you think that, Dave? Guess why he said, I only see the dude at the football game with the crazy hair. Yeah. Now here's why I don't go to church. That dude's a hypocrite, because it's at the football game. Yeah. That's who you're working with. Look at your neighbor and say biblical illiteracy. Now look at your other neighbor and say ignorant. We need to teach people the gospel. We need to teach people. We are a generation that has not gone to church. We don't know what the Bible says. Your friends think it is a thousand pages. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex. Man, God's into a lot of don'ts. I remember the first evangelistic Bible study my wife ever led. She was kind of nervous. And there was like 10 people. It was a crazy study. We had all these different friends. Jesus would have been very proud. We had one woman who, uh, I don't want to even go there. Um, but my wife led her first evangelistic Bible study. And there was a guy named Pablo who came. Pablo was a, barely a reader. But after we did it, we did Luke 5, 1 to 11, The Great Catch. And after the study, we were having snacks. Becky's like, do you think it went well? And I go, look at Pablo. And Pablo is sitting there, Luke 5. And it's like, he's getting it, Luke 6. He couldn't believe, like, Jesus is real. He's beautiful. So one, your friends don't know. Secondly, we have a resource challenge. And I think particularly with CCDA, that's one of the reasons that I took the new role that I did with uh, my denomination. I remember being an evangelist at Compton City College. So that uh, kept me on my toes. And at the time, the hot evangelism resource was a seeker Bible study guide. And it was radical because they said, use a DVD. Right? So you pop in the DVD. And the, the flow of the study is a movie. So guess what the movie was? City Slickers. And it's the... This is where they're really grappling with the midlife crisis and Jack Palance and put that in and it will work. Well, I go to Strong and I walk up to Strong. Strong has an 80 font across his neck, Samoa Crips. And he's a big dude. He's strong. He's strong. Do you want to watch City Slickers? <laughs> Are you going through some midlife crisis? Should we hit the Ponderosa? I just realized we need new resources to help people in their evangelism. So a friend of mine, Dr. Alex G., we wrote a book about seven years ago called Jesus and the Hip Hop Prophets. And it's basically the story of the Bible through Tupac and Lauryn Hill. We're trying to do that. Maybe you could show the first slide. Um, this is the slide that we're going with. With my, I could totally use your prayers um, 72 is going to be kind of the brand of all the resources that we're coming out with in the next six months. So our tagline is, every pastor leads the mission, and every Christian tells the story. Wouldn't that make your ministry and your church a beautiful place? So if you could pray for that, that'd be great. The second connection to education is, uh, there are some folks in our church that have really gone through some stuff. And there's one young man who's part of the Male Academy. The Male Academy started at Long Beach, Jordan. And it came out of a, a race riot at Long Beach, Jordan. So it's a black and brown race riot. And they were looking for help. So they take all of the 10 high schools, feed into Jordan, which is the most impoverished school. And they have a program where they're trying to rebuild character in really these at-risk. So if you're in the program, you got some real challenges. So they invited me in. And I ended up coming once a week uh, for fourth period. 
They called it, it was really funny because it's a Cambodian pastor, or a Cambodian teacher who used to be in the gangs. He's out of the gangs, doesn't care for church, but he really likes it. So he's always like, hey, teach him the Bible. So they call it fourth period mentoring. I call it fourth period Bible study. So maybe you could show that picture in the back. So these are all our guys at Long Beach Jordan. And I've learned so much about how much people actually need the scripture. So we did one study on John 2, and in John 2, it's the water into wine. So I just asked them the question, where are you out of wine? And then to keep some anonymity, I pass out index cards, because high school guys aren't the coolest to, let me share my pain. I'm blown away, 50 cards. Here's where I'm out of wine, will you pray for me? Um, my family's really going through this, will you pray for me? I think I may actually be open to going to church, will you pray for me? And it makes me realize Jesus isn't kidding when he says the fields mm -hmm. are ripe. Yeah, yeah. Look up. Yeah, the yeah. fields are ripe. Tell the story. The fields are ripe. You might get rejected. Yeah. But if you get rejected, I think there's one song that every Christian, and especially urban Christian, needs to learn. God rest her soul, Aaliyah. Do you remember that one? From the, from the movie Romeo Must Die? If at first you don't succeed, dust yourself off and try again. <laughs> what happens is Christians, we try, we fall down, and we don't get up. Dust yourself off and try again. <laughs> so I'm on a kick. My kick these days is to share the gospel. We need to do it with quality and quantity. Jesus batted 250. When he threw out his seed. You're probably going to do less than that. <laughs> Let me close with a story and an exhortation. <laughs> I met David about five years ago. Uh, David fits the demographic of the... Uh, oh, we'll save that one. Okay. Uh, David fits the demographic down the street of all the guys. He's a little older, so he aged out of Male Academy. He lives two houses down from us, uh, down the street. I first met his dad. So when I met his dad, he was on the porch, a big, heavy dude, and he had tortilla flats tattooed on his chest and the L.A. Dodger logo on his stomach. So he sees me coming, and he goes, hold on one second. I thought he was going to go in and put on a shirt, but he comes out and he puts on his shades. <laughs> So I tell him what I'm doing, and uh, he goes, oh, you teach the Bible, dude? I go, yeah, I, I love the Bible. I teach the Bible. He goes, dude, my baby mama need the Bible. <laughs> and I was like, well, clearly you got your stuff together. <laughs> she needs the Bible. It turns out she really did need the Bible because the mom uh, partied really hard, was driving down our block, and in a drunken haze, rammed three cars on our block. That's a lot more neighbor than hood, right? <laughs> this is his family. Uh, I saw him smoking weed regularly with his oldest daughter at the park. I'd kind of chide and, you know, get to know him, but build trust. David's sister, I remember when she was in fifth grade, the sweetest little girl. Five years later, she's walking down the street, and she confides in me. Um, she's hanging with all these older dudes. She's now 13, 14. And she tells me how she's pregnant at 14. Um, she went on. Currently, she's in prison right now for violence. And we have a youth minister that's been pouring into her. And she was who we came to. She came to our house when she ripped off her ankle bracelet. Because she was under house arrest. Uh, things got more spiritual when about a year ago they came over to, you know, we have a home office. They came over to our house and they're like, we got some crazy stuff going on at our house. Demons are in our house. So I took the holy oil and I went over there and I go, what's going on? They said, objects are, are flying, like objects are flying. Lights are turning on and off. They hear voices. And I said, well, I'm a pastor. You do have demons in your house. And then I said, but as your pastor... The demons are there because they're like rats and sin is trash. What, they're here because you got stuff going on. You got to get your life cleaned up. Let's get the demons out. So we Criscoed the whole house and in the name of Jesus. Nothing changed yet. Nothing changed. 
I wanted to kind of just build some friendship with him, so I took David to a Laker game. I work with the L.A. Laker band. The Lakers have a band. So I took David. You can show the slide. I took David to go uh, to the game, and that night we saw Oscar from The Office, if you have Office fans. Now, I love romantic comedies as well. If you've seen The Proposal, Oscar kills it in The Proposal. So I went up to Oscar, and I go, Oscar, when you did this move, hey, remember me? In the proposal? Okay, no one has seen that scene. <laughs> we had such a great laugh. And David goes, wow, you can actually be a Christian, be a pastor, and be fun. It was a great moment. <laughs> I had a conversation with David, and I said, David, the Bible is like an icon on your desktop. On, they have a family computer. If you have your Internet Explorer right there, it's an icon. But if you click it twice, a whole new world opens up. Did you know the Bible is waiting for you to experience it and it will become alive for you? So guess what? Three weeks ago, David and his friend Alex, who was the hood of hoods on our street, they show up to our weekly Bible study. We do Genesis 1. Do you know how amazing it is for someone from a rough background to go, you're not an accident? Your parents may be totally screwed up, but God has a plan. You are made in his image. The three days, the containers that God makes are good. The, three, uh, the, three, the next three days that he fills the containers are better, but you are the pinnacle. You are very good. He took week one and he came back last week. Do you know that God is this close to you? And he breathed. He could have made you anyway. He took dust and he formed it and he shaped it and he grew it. And he, he breathed into you. That's how much God loves you. And do you know from Genesis 2 that talks about work? Work is pre-fall. You got to get a job. So that week someone for uh, In-N-Out Burger is hiring. They just opened up In-N-Out Burger down our street. So I go, for the love of God, get a job, man. I, I need you to work for me at In-N-Out Burger. So we, we do an In-N-Out Burger thing. It takes two hours online. So my friend who's a grad student at USC is just helping him online. His big uh, thing is Tuesday. He has his interview Tuesday. And he comes in, and then finally I go, David, do you know the story of the gospel? Do you know what Jesus did and why? And I told him the, the story. And David said... I want that. I want to be successful and I want to go to heaven. I need to change today. So David became a Christian. He goes out and he tells the 20 people, you guys, I'm following Jesus now. My sister-in-law who lives on the street almost fell out. <laughs> and then one of the younger guys who's 28, David's a huge boxing fan. He looks, he goes, you know what Floyd Mayweather's mantra is? Hard work, dedication. You be there at 8 o'clock, you're going to be on my setup team. Heal the sick, proclaim the kingdom. And here's my exhortation. One of the eight components of CCDA is relocation. Guess what? The devil is a relocator too. And he is in the cities, working through families, working through people, working hard. He is putting in work. It's not just living there. It's what you do. Open your mouth. Tell the story. You have a speak bubble. Tell the story in your way. The best evangelist in the New Testament was a woman who said, could this be the one? Let Jesus take control. But open your mouth and tell the story. It's not where you live. It's what we do. Heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom. Amen? Amen. 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 Thanks, John. Well, as we close tonight, um, we want to have an opportunity to pray for those who want to be prayed for. When Martha told Jesus, uh, I believe you are the Messiah, and then the next thing that she did is she went and told her sister. She went and she said, the teacher is here and he wants to see you. And I think um, many of us have been very aware that the teacher is here. And I say tonight that he wants to see you. 
And if there are things that, that you came carrying and you're dreading going back to, or in all the training and the inspiring, there's still places that, that you need to be healed and that um, you want to be prayed over. Don't, don't leave here tonight without having your brothers and sisters pray for you, without um, getting the healing that the Lord has for you. Let's go back changed um, from how we came. I've asked some of you to, to be here and available to pray with those who want to be prayed for. If you could just come up now, um, we're going to go into a time of prayer. If you want to be prayed for, don't just come on up as, as people get in place. And John's going to pray for us all together. Wonderful. Thank you, Jesus, that you are here, that you are the Lord of life. You're the second person of the Trinity. You're the living God, and your passion and mission is to go to those on the margins and declare a new kingdom that will completely overthrow the kingdom of this world. God, I pray that even as Chrissy uh, shared so eloquently and symbolically, that you'll heal pain. Mm -hmm. Thank you, God, in Psalm 58, it says, you keep your tears in a bottle. God, heal pain now. Heal pain uh, from ministry. Heal pain from conflicts. Heal pain from hitting the wall over and over and over again. We just pray for new dimensions to come. We pray for new intimacy to come with you. We pray for more of your Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. And God, I want to pray especially uh, for those of us who want to be witnesses, I pray against the Goliath that's guarding our cities, which is the Goliath of fear. I pray that you will give us new power to turn from our fear, fear that we're going to say the wrong thing, fear that we're going to be rejected. We just declare we will say the wrong thing, we will be rejected, and that's exactly what Paul did, that's exactly what all of the witnesses in Scripture did. Empower us with the new spirit, God, to dust ourselves off and try again. Make us learners. God, I pray that you will break hearts for the Davids in our city, the 20-year-olds that the world is leading, that the devil is leading. God, intervention uh, is possible through your Holy Spirit and the kingdom. So I pray that you will just give a new dose of the Holy Spirit, that where we are, we might be witnesses. 84% of America does not go to church. Will you help us assume that everyone we meet doesn't know the story? And will you empower us from deep within to tell the story? And Jesus, we want to have joy that is in Luke 10. We want to see cities transform. We want to see Satan fall. And we know that you massively change cities by massively changing individuals. Bring that kind of transformation because we love your Bible and it flows out into people. Please be with us, God. Send us out in your power. We just declare that there is none other where would we be? Who else would we follow? There's no one but you, Lord Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.